Good morning, class. Welcome to another fun-filled week of civics. Um, so last week we covered the Constitution. Uh, so this week we are going to cover the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. Um, we've only had 27 amendments since the Constitution uh, was created, and the first 10 of those were within just the first uh, few years of the Constitution's existence. Um, we now refer to those amendments as the Bill of Rights. Uh, so these Bill of Rights spell out the uh, Americans' individual rights in relation to the government. Um, so the Bill of Rights guarantees civil rights, civil liberties, uh, things like freedom of the speech of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Um, the Bill of Rights also set rules for due process, and I'll uh, define due process for you later on in the lecture. Um, they it also uh, makes sure that um, the Bill of Rights also ensure that any rights that aren't in the Constitution are rights that we as individuals still hold. Uh, so we'll go into more detail about all of the individual amendments and the details during this lecture. So this video is a, um, it's not too long. I urge you to start it as like an intro point. It goes over the Bill of Rights uh, in not a crazy amount of detail, but just kind of gives you a broad overview. That way when um, you start reading more information about each amendment, you kind of already uh, have a, a head start. So I urge you to watch that, this video before um, reading on for the rest of your notes. So what are the Bill of Rights? The Founding Fathers uh, believed that protecting individual rights um, and providing for our safety, for the, the well-being of citizens, that that was the most important purpose of government. Uh, the Constitution may not have even been ratified if the Bill of Rights hadn't been promised later. So in 1791, the Ten Amendments um, in the Bill of Rights uh, were added, um, and they put strict limits on how national government can use power over people. So the Bill of Rights protects civil liberties. Civil liberties is defined as the freedoms that we have to think and to act without government interference or fear of unfair treatment from the government. Um, the, civil liberties are the cornerstone of our democracy. They, they ensure that each of us can develop, develop our own beliefs, that we can express ourselves freely, that we can meet openly with others, that we can have our views on public matters heard by members of our government. Um, it is of the utmost importance. Uh, so you may also remember during our debate, our Federalist, Anti-Federalist debate last week, that it was the Anti-Federalists who really, really wanted a Bill of Rights. So the Bill of Rights, we we can see as an Anti-Federalist win. So we're going to start with the First Amendment. Um, this one is multifaceted. It's going to take us a couple of slides to cover. But here's the basics. So the First Amendment provides several rights um, and protections to those rights. Uh, you can express ideas through speech, through the press. You can assemble or gather with a group of protesters, or you can gather for any reason you want to. Um, and you have the right to ask the government to fix your problems. Uh, that's what petition is. Um, this amendment also protects your right to religious beliefs and practices. And it also prevents the government from creating or favoring their own religion. Um, so let's start there. Let's start with religion and go into a little bit more detail about what this amendment really does in terms of religion. So there's two parts to this. Uh, intolerance of different beliefs in their homelands forced many of the colonists to come to America in the first place. So like, that's why religion was so important to our founding fathers and, and the belief that we should be allowed to, to practice our own religion, because that was a lot of the reason they fleed um, Europe in the first place. So the First Amendment safeguards religious freedom in two different ways. So first, it prohibits Congress from establishing an official religion in the United States. This is known as the Establishment Clause. Um, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, will later refer to this as the, quote, wall of separation between church and state, um, which you've probably heard before, uh, separation of church and state. This is where this comes from, the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause. 
Um, but the amendment also guarantees Americans right to practice what they want. So not only is the government not going to pick a favorite religion or force a religion on you, you also are allowed to practice whatever religion you wish. Um, but I mean, I want you to think about it. Do you think in our country that there is a religion that's more favored than another? Do you think that there's a religion in our country that is more, um, uh, has seen in a less favorable light than any other religions? Um, maybe you think no, maybe you think yes, but this is just something you should think about. Our founding fathers wanted, did not want any religion and government overlap. Do you think that's something that exists today? Kind of think about that. So freedom of speech. Freedom of speech um, pretty much just guarantees that we can say what's on our minds. This is in public or private, and we don't have to fear punishment from the government. Um, over the years, the Supreme Court has defined speech in many different ways. It can be art, internet communication, music, clothing, the color of your hair. All of that is, is like a form of speech. Um, but there are limitations to your freedom of speech. Um, for example, you, you're free to talk to your friends in the street if you want to, free to gather and chat all you want, but you can't block traffic. You can't, you can't hinder everyone else or put other people in danger. You can't um, go into a crowded theater and scream fire when there is no fire and cause an unnecessary panic. Why? Because you're putting people in danger. You can't just speak your mind if, if, if it means putting people in danger. Um, you can also, although you can criticize the government, you can't lie. That's known as slander. If you're you're spreading spoken untruths intentionally to ruin someone's reputation, that's called slander, and that is illegal. Um, same with libel. A libel is slander. It's the same thing, except it's written down. So you are it's libel if it's a written lie. So those are some examples where your speech is limited. But those are those are pretty reasonable um, limitations to speech overall. So now let's do the press. Um, press used to mean, you know, when they first wrote the amendment, you know, newspapers, magazines, like printed word. But now press is any type of media. So like we've got radio, television, um, the internet in general, a lot of that is the press. There's just newsrooms that are just online now. Uh, so this part of the amendment protects those sources of media from, um, government intervention. So uh, the founders wanted to make sure that the, the American people had a lot of viewpoints, right? That they could hear a lot of different viewpoints from a lot of different people and the government wasn't going to get in the way of that. Um, you may have heard like of something called state media. So like Russia has state media, China has state media. These are media outlets like the quote unquote Russia CNN. It's not actually Russian CNN, but like but it's owned by the government. So like the news that they have in Russia is created and, and given by the government. We don't like that in America. We like government and press to be separate because we want the press to hold the government accountable when they do something wrong. So we are very big into letting the press have their freedom and not have government interference. Um, government interference would be known as censorship. Censorship just means banning materials just because they want to. Um, there are, of course, limitations. Again, you cannot put a pornographic video on a television news site, right? There are limitations to what, what freedom of the press really means. Um, you also can't print something that might threaten national security. There have been Supreme Court cases about this. So if there's, if a uh, journalist gets all this information and really wants to publish and tell the public about it, but it will put like, you know, the military in jeopardy or it'll put civilians in jeopardy because of, of national security, you're not allowed to do that, which is also fair. Um, but for the most part, the um, courts especially will side with freedom of the press over government intervention almost every time. And then we have freedom of assembly. Um, this is pretty much what you'd expect. You know, you have the right to peacefully attend a meeting, peacefully attend a parade, a political rally. Um, the government can't ban you from going. They can have restrictions like, you know, you have to have permits, noise permits, you know, to be on certain pieces of property, but they're not, they can't outright ban you. The government can't ban you. The reason I also wanted to talk about this specifically because freedom of assembly has also uh, started to include freedom of association. So the courts have decided that, 
you know, assembly means just joining a group at all. You don't have to meet with that group in person for for it to qualify as assembly. So you are allowed to be a member of a labor union. You are allowed to belong to a social club, a political party, um, and and the government can't interfere with that. And that falls under the freedom of assembly. So this video goes into way more detail, freedom of speech. This is our guy, Craig, over at Crash Course, big fan. Um, so if you want to go into some uh, more detail as to what the freedom of speech, the First Amendment really means, um, I suggest you watch this video. He also goes into detail about how money is speech. I'm not going to talk about that with you yet, not until we get more into elections, but um, that's also very interesting as well. Second Amendment. So this might be your least favorite or your favorite amendment. However, um, a lot of people have a very strong opinion. Maybe you have no opinion. Uh, if you don't know anyone in your life with a strong opinion, I'll be shocked. There's probably someone in your life who has a strong Second Amendment opinion. So the debate over what rights exactly are guaranteed by the Second Amendment um, are is, is something that we still talk about a lot today. So here's the wording of the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So some people argue that this amendment provides only for each state to maintain a quote, well-regulated militia um, by allowing those members to carry arms. When the second amendment was written, militias were a thing. It, a militia was a small local army of volunteer soldiers. Um, so the argument is that they were talking about those people who are in a volunteer military that they are allowed to own arms. Uh, other people argue that the Second Amendment guarantees the right of all individual citizens to keep and bear arms without interference of the government. Um, generally, over decades, um, centuries, the courts have generally ruled that the government can pass laws to control but not prevent the possession of weapons. Most Second Amendment issues side on the on on the freedom of the right to bear arms side. Um, so, although federal and state laws can determine who can own a license or how long you have to wait or what tests you have to pass, they can't just straight up ban you from owning a weapon unless you are like a felon or something similar. So, this video is great. It's PBS. I really like the woman who she makes keeps it interesting. So like, it is a longer video, but if you wanna get more into like the Second Amendment debate, which I'm sure at least a couple of you are really into it, I suggest you watch this because this is pretty good. Um, she goes into way more detail than I would ever need you to know, but I still think it's really interesting. So the Third Amendment is weird um, because it's probably the least relevant of anything you'll ever need in your life, And but I could be wrong. Um, but basically, the Third Amendment prevents the government from forcing a homeowner to allow a soldier to use their home. So if you remember during, uh, before the Revolutionary War, there were laws that gave British soldiers the right to take over private homes. Um, and that made a lot of colonists really upset, understandably. Um, and so they wanted to make sure this would never happen again. So technically, if a soldier walked up to your parents' house, and knocked on the door and said, hey, I'm going to live here. They have the right to say no because of the Third Amendment. I mean, that sounds a little ridiculous, but you never know. So, I mean, maybe this is maybe this is a regular occurrence in your life, that there are random military people knocking on your door asking to sleep over. Um, if so, then the Third Amendment must be pretty handy so you can turn them away. You can also let them stay, have a party. Uh, totally your call because of the Third Amendment. So, not a super relevant amendment, but still part of the Bill of Rights. All right, so these next couple of amendments are going to focus on um, the rights of the accused. So there are going to be a lot of criminal justice issues coming up. Fourth, fifth, sixth, all have to do with um, criminal rights, pretty much. So the fourth one is probably the least detailed, which is good. We'll start with an easier one. So the Fourth Amendment bars the government from unreasonable search and seizure of an individual or of their private property. But there are, of course, um, instances where law enforcement can uh, search you. So if a law enforcement officer believes that you have committed a crime, they can ask a judge to issue a search warrant. 
So a search warrant is a court order allowing law enforcement officers to search a suspect's home or business and take specific items as evidence. Um, but they don't give out search warrants easily. Uh, it's not, they, they don't give them out willy nilly. They have to be convinced. You, you, the law enforcement officer has to convince the judge that there's a very probable chance that they are going to find some type of evidence of criminal activity. Um, which is good because if warrants were just issued frivolously, if they, if judges let, um, you know, gave out search warrants like candy on Halloween, then the fourth amendment would basically be useless, right? We wouldn't have this, any sense of security. We could be nervous that any time day or night police would invade our privacy and confiscate our possessions. Um, the fourth amendment stops them from doing that. So we, uh, have this, uh, reasonable right to our own property. So the Fifth Amendment, oh, ooh. so this video goes into the Fourth Amendment. It's not super interesting, but they do a good job of using visuals to explain it, which can be super helpful for me, especially when I'm learning. So if you want the Fourth Amendment explained with um, a little bit more of a flair, then uh, this video is really good for that. So Fifth Amendment is multifaceted. So the Fifth Amendment provides several protections to the to people who are accused of crimes. There's a couple of different parts to this one. Um, first, it states that serious criminal charges must be started by a grand jury. So um, a grand jury, uh, jury in general, just means a group of your peers who, who are in charge of deciding your guilt or innocence. Um, and it was very important for the founding fathers to ensure that we had a right to a jury so that our peers were the ones who were saying whether or not we were innocent or guilty. It's not, it's not quote unquote, the man deciding whether or not you are guilty. Um, the fifth amendment also protects against double jeopardy, horrible, horrible movie called double jeopardy, which is actually, it's supposed to be based off this amendment and it's not. So I don't even want to, oh my gosh, it's so bad. Never watch that movie. Although don't tell Dr. Walston that because he loves that movie, so don't tell him that I told you not to watch it. But there is a movie called Double Jeopardy that does not explain Double Jeopardy property properly. So do not, do not listen. <clears throat> what Double Jeopardy means is basically a person can't be tried twice for the same offense. So if I was accused of murder and I went to trial and I was found innocent, the prosecutor can't decide, no, I know she's guilty. I don't care. I want to do this all over again and charge me again for murder. No, you had your shot, bro. I'm innocent. I was found innocent. You can't put me on trial again. They can try and find a different crime to accuse me of, but they can't try me for murder again. Um, the Fifth Amendment is probably best known for the whole right to remain silent. If you have ever been bored when you're sick home or, gosh, quarantine and we're scrolling through your random channels and you found Law and Order. Uh, if you have never accidentally watched Law and Order, then I don't know what you're doing with your life. But you will have seen someone say, hey, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can be used against you in the court of law. That comes from the Fifth Amendment. Um, and this is actually really important. The reason it's so important is basically it says, if you're arrested, you don't have to say anything. They can ask you, cops can ask you any questions they want and you can just sit there quietly and they can't do anything about it. Um, why? Because, all right, do you guys have those friends who sometimes they put their foot in their mouth and get themselves in trouble even if they didn't do anything wrong? Right, this is to, a, this is to stop that from happening. It stops people from getting themselves in trouble just by talking and saying ugh, bad things and and making themselves seem more guilty than they really are. If you have the right to be quiet, you can't incriminate yourself. Just shut up and sit and everything will be fine. Um, the Fifth Amendment also, see, we're just, just getting started with this amendment, also protects due process. So due process is defined as the fair treatment through the normal justice system of law. It's the basic legal procedure that everyone gets and, and the Fifth Amendment protects it. So every person gets the right to a speedy and fair trial, the right to remain silent. Everyone gets the right to a jury. They have the right to hear what they're being accused of. That's all due process. So the Fifth Amendment protects anyone who is accused of a crime and makes sure that they everyone, everyone deserves their, their time in court. Um, and last but not least, this amendment uh, talks about eminent domain. So uh, 
this has to do with a citizen's property. Um, it limits the government from from taking private property for public use. Uh, there is something called eminent domain, which gives the government, um, pr- uh, if the government needs your land for something, an example would be if they're building a big highway through the state and where they're going to build the highway is right on your land. Some That's an example of when you'd have to give money uh, or they would give you money for your land. Uh, but that is also covered in the Fifth Amendment. So Khan Academy, this is a longer video, I get it. In my defense, first of all, the Fifth Amendment has a lot that goes into it. I don't necessarily think you need to watch the whole thing unless you think you do, but if there's one part of the amendment that's like confusing to you, scroll to that part of the video because they do go into really good detail and they do a great job of explaining, but I also recognize that it's a long video. Um, so if there's any part of the Fifth Amendment you want like clarified, this is a good video to go to. So then we have the Sixth Amendment. We're still on the rights of the accused. Um, So the Sixth Amendment provides additional protections for those accused of crimes. And it includes the right to a speedy and public trial, um, a trial by an impartial jury in criminal cases, and your right to be informed of those criminal trials. Um, Witnesses must also, can also face the accused and the accused is allowed to question their own witnesses and be represented by a lawyer. So there's a lot that I just said right there. So there's a lot that goes into this. But basically, um, if the accused person asks for a jury trial, the trial must be speedy and public. You don't have to sit in jail for years waiting for your trial. Um, Those jurors that are chosen have to be impartial. This actually gets tricky. So like you have to find jurors who have no prior knowledge of the case, who don't know anyone involved, who don't have any type of like... um, you know, if, if, if they are racist and the person accuses black, you're not going to be chosen, right? Because you're not going to be an impartial judge. Things like that. Uh, but like, think about like the OJ Simpson trial. I understand you guys are young, but you've probably still heard of OJ Simpson. So like when that went to trial, they had to find 12 jurors who were impartial, who didn't know anything about the case. So they had to find 12 adult individuals who were basically living under a rock for their whole life, who had never heard of, because you can't, you can't go into the trial with any type of, of knowledge because you have, you have to go in with a clean slate. Um, so sometimes it's really difficult to find impartial jurors. Uh, mostly it's not, but that's just one of those cases that I, I always think, man, it must have been difficult for them to find 12 people who did not know anything about the OJ Simpson case. Simpson case. Um, so... It also requires this uh, for the um, trial to take place nearby. And this is important, too, because, like, if you are accused of a crime, you don't want and you're in, like, Louisiana, you don't want, like, a bunch of jurors from, like, California to decide whether or not you're innocent or guilty. You want people in your area who who are familiar with your culture almost um, to be the, pe- the people who are on your jury. Um, and... And that's for a lot of reasons, but mostly it's just because we really are an enormous country with a lot of different types of people. And if it really is going to be a jury of your peers, they need to really be your peers and be people who live in, um, live around you. Uh, so the accused individuals have the right to hear and question all witnesses against them. Um, you can also call witnesses in your own defense. If someone's accusing you of something, you have the right to question them. Um, you're also entitled to have a lawyer. The Supreme Court has since ruled that an accused person, if you can't afford a lawyer, the government will give you one. And this is pretty simple. It's really hard to win a trial if you don't know what you're doing. If you don't aren't versed in law, how are you supposed to win a trial? Um, and if you can't afford a lawyer, does that mean that you should have to go to jail because you don't know what you're doing up there? No, you should be provided a licensed lawyer to deal with this for you because if not it's just not fair to the person who's accused of a crime so all of this is covered in the sixth amendment um i do know that that's a lot but i provided one of those super great videos for you uh this one i would suggest you just watch a minute and a half long goes into more detail about the sixth amendment um and they just sound a lot smarter than i do so maybe that'll be better you never know So the Seventh Amendment uh, is different. So we were concentrating on criminal law for the last three amendments. This amendment has to do with civil law. Civil law uh, basically just means 
disagreement between people. So it's not anyone who did anything illegal. It's just an example would be a divorce proceeding. That's a civil proceeding because it's just two people, um, you know, against each other with a disagreement and they're trying to get it settled in court. Uh, so the Seventh Amendment basically just says that if, for a civil trial, you're allowed to have a jury if you want to, uh, as long as the dispute is more than twenty dollars. If it's less than twenty dollars and you're at the court, I don't know what you're doing. I'll pay. I'll pay it. I mean, just call on me. I'll Venmo you. Because goodness gracious, what a waste of time. But when this was first written, twenty dollars was a lot more money. Keep that in mind. Twenty dollars in the 1700s was probably. Oh gosh, I don't know. Inflation's crazy. Got to be over a hundred bucks though. Um, if anyone wants to look it up and tell me, they can. Uh, so all the Seventh Amendment says that if you want to, you can either have a judge oversee your proceedings and decide how um, things go, or you can have a jury. That's what the Seventh Amendment says. I'm telling you, these people are very big into juries. And actually, so this video goes, uh, there's a law professor who kind of goes into detail as to why the Founding Fathers uh, thought the jury process was so important. And so that's really interesting. So I encourage you to watch this video as well. So the Eighth Amendment. Eighth Amendment is another really good one. There's two parts to it. Um, so the first part has to do with excessive bail and fines, and the second part has to do with cruel and unusual punishment. So let's start with excessive uh, bail. Although the Sixth Amendment guaranteed the right to a speedy trial. Sometimes in our country, there are months that go by before a case can be heard. Um, and during that time, the accused has two options. So if you're accused of a crime and you haven't gone to trial yet, you can either stay in jail and wait, wait it out, wait for your trial, or you can pay bail. Um, bail is a sum of money used as a security deposit. If the accused person comes back to court for the trial, they get the money back. So if your bail was a hundred bucks, you got out, you came for your trial, you get your money back, you get your hundred bucks back. But if the person fails to appear, the bail is forfeited. So if you don't come to your court date, you don't get your hundred bucks back and you're a wanted fugitive. So you have a lot going on in your life. So a judge decides how much a bail, that much bail a person needs to pay. And this amendment forbids excessive bail. So an amount that would just be too high. It doesn't just refer to what like a person can't pay. So it would be ridiculous to put a $5 million bail on a teacher like me because under no circumstances will I be able to afford a $5 million bail. Um, but if I was a multi-million dollar bank executive person, $5 million might be a reasonable amount because I am loaded and can afford it. Um, but there's other things that the judge looks at, not just how much a person can afford. They also look at the type of crime committed. Of course, the more serious or the crime or more violent the crime, the higher the bail is going to be. Um, they'll look at your record. So if this is your um, fifth thing you've been arrested for or something, maybe you'll have a higher bail. And they'll also look at your likelihood to actually come to court. If you are someone who um, has run before, or uh, has passports to all these different countries and they're afraid that you're just gonna hop a plane, they might uh, make the bail really high. Because um, it needs to be an amount of money that you are unwilling to forfeit, that you want back. You're gonna show up to court because you want your money back. Or in some cases, bail can just be denied. Uh, if you, are, like if it, for a super violent crime where you could, you're a danger to other people, maybe um, the, judge doesn't even let you have a bail, which it doesn't happen often, but it, it can happen. So the Eighth Amendment also forbids cruel and unusual punishment. So for many years, Americans have debated what kinds of punishments are cruel and unusual. Um, generally, we agree that punishment should fit the crime, right? Um, a, a sentence of life imprisonment for stealing a loaf of bread to feed your family seems utterly ridiculous, right? That would be a cruel and unusual punishment. Um, in my opinion, a cruel and unusual punishment would be going to jail for 10 years for having a joint in your pocket. But there are people who are actually living that life, which is very frustrating. But uh, that to me is something that is a cruel and unusual punishment. Punishment does not fit the crime. So where the debate comes in is when we talk about the death penalty. People strongly disagree on whether or not the death penalty is a cruel and unusual punishment. If you're gonna go based on the balance theory, then if you're a mass murderer, then the balance 
of dying fits the crime, right? You murder people, the you die. That's that fits the crime. But um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I actually have an assignment this week that has you guys do a little bit of research on the death penalty. But uh, there have been multiple instances of people being put to death, being found guilty of a crime, being put to death, and then later DNA evidence proves that they were innocent. So an argument against the death penalty is that because the justice system isn't perfect and because there are people who are illegally put to death, it shouldn't be allowed. Um, it's one thing to put someone in jail wrongly because you can fix that wrong, kind of. You can release them from jail. You can't bring someone back to life. So that one's a little bit more difficult to fix. Um, but I'm excited to see your opinions on the death penalty in your assignment this week. Uh, so this is a video from Time, so it's actually pretty good. It's not too long either. Uh, I highly suggest you watch it. It goes into more detail on the Eighth Amendment. Two more, guys. Woo -woo. So the Ninth Amendment is a good one. Ninth, Ninth Amendment was a smart move, in my opinion, of the for the founding fathers. So it basically states that the listed rights in the Constitution are not the only rights that we have as individuals. Just because it is not written down, spelled out in the Bill of Rights or in the Constitution does not mean that it is not a right guaranteed to an individual. Um, it, it, this amendment basically prevents the government from claiming that those are the only rights that you have. Uh, the Ninth Amendment makes it clear that citizens have other rights besides those listed in the Constitution. Example, privacy. The word privacy is technically not in the Constitution. Um, and although it is kind of discussed-ish in the Fourth Amendment, it's still not actually listed. But we, the people, have a reasonable right to privacy. Um, that is one of our rights that are not listed in the Constitution, but we still have. That's an example of something that would fall under the Ninth Amendment. They were covering their butts. They were saying, hey, all right, we can't think of everything. We can't write down everything. So we need to make sure that we have a loophole that says just because we didn't write it down doesn't mean you don't have the right to it. This is that loophole. The ninth, this guy is so weird in this video, but he's really smart. And honestly, man, history teachers are just weird and there's nothing you can do about it. So I just, if you're going to have a history teacher make a video, he's probably, oh, that's me right now. Oh, man, I guess I'm pretty weird. I don't think I'm as weird as this guy. Anyways, very informative video. Goes into more detail about the Ninth Amendment and how important it is. So if you're confused about it or want more info, this is a great video. Or you want to see the guy who I think is really weird, this is a good video for you. Anywho, Tenth Amendment. <clears throat> tenth Amendment. Tenth of ten. Guys, tenth of ten. We're almost there. The Tenth Amendment says that the federal government only has the powers delegated in the Constitution. If it's not listed in the Constitution, it belongs to the states or to the people. So the Tenth Amendment is also known as the, I mean, it, it's, it's what discusses the reserved powers of the Constitution. Reserved because all of the powers that the Tenth Amendment really talks about um, are reserved for the state governments. So, the Tenth Amendment is actually the only amendment that doesn't actually add anything to the Constitution. All it really does is say that anything not listed here as a right that the federal government can do is not a right that they have to do. It's something that um, the state governments have a right to do. So an example would be uh, schools, right? My paycheck. I am a state employee, not a federal employee. The school system is organized by the states. Um, another good example are elections. The primary process and the election process, even what ballots look like, all of that is decided by the state because it's not something that the Constitution said was the job of the federal government. So the state gets to do it. Um, this is an important addition, uh, especially for the anti-federalists, because this is what prevented the federal government from becoming too strong. This stops the, the Congress and the president from claiming they have all these powers they don't have. Um, this, gave, this gives those powers to the states instead. Uh, and there are some examples of things that both federal and state government can do, like tax. That's why when I get my paycheck, I have one number, that's all the money I'm giving to the state, one number, that's the money I'm giving to the federal government, and then a smaller number, that's how much I get to put in my bank account. And, and that's depressing. But that's because both state and federal government can collect taxes from me. Um, there are also courts 
and prisons at the federal level, and there are courts and prisons at the state level. Uh, I'm going to go into way more detail about reserved powers when we talk more about federalism later in the semester and when we talk about the difference between federal government and state government. But for now, what I really want you to understand is that the 10th Amendment basically said, if the federal government doesn't have the right to do something given to it in the Constitution, then they don't have a right to it. That is the states. The states get to do it. That is what the 10th Amendment is. This video goes into more detail, per usual. Not a long one. Highly suggest you watch it. It's not too bad. So then this video is another Khan Academy, and it's not too long, but it's a really great summary video. So after you've gone through all of the Bill of Rights, if you watch this video, this will go through them all again, kind of um, organizes it a little bit for you, goes in a little bit more detail, but this is a really great uh, summary video. Um, and yeah, that's it. Congratulations. You did the, the Bill of Rights. Woo! One of the best subjects around, in my opinion. Uh, if you guys have any questions about anything, please send me an email and let me know. Thank you so much.